So um, the final presentation this morning is meeting report on the uh, electronic health records uh, meeting that Jeff Strewing is going to present. Great, thank you. I think I'll be able to go relatively quickly on this. This was a, a meeting that emanated from the, the Arley House meeting uh, on genomics and health IT systems, exploring the issues. Um, you can see the, the planning group there really Greg um, led this very ably. Greg, are you on the phone? I am. Can okay, you hear me? Greg. Yes, we can hear you. Um, so Great. you have a copy, I think, of, of these slides. Um, and I Rex, do, and I'm on the webcast as well. Oh, okay, great. Um, Rex was there, and, and Terry was a, a, a participant in this, so they can speak up as well. Um, so this was meant to be a relatively high-level um, kind of meeting to look at the issues. It was a typical NIH kind of meeting with 90 participants or so, broad representation from academia, from numerous government agencies, very importantly from the Office of the Secretary, from Center for Medicare and Medicaid, FDA, and the HHS Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. We had some vendors there and insurers and professional societies and such. And it was meant to address these two, two kinds of uh, questions or issues. What are, what are those surrounding the intersection or some might fear collision of, of the health clinical IT systems in the US and genomics and how we integrate the Arab genomic medicine into, into this infrastructure um, to look at what are the opportunities and challenges to fully realize the potential benefits of genomic integration and then look at what are the potential downsides and, and pitfalls. Um, I'm just gonna cover a, a few of the highlights. Um, Greg is working on a first draft of a report. It was a very interesting, very, very good meeting. It was a very interactive audience and I think, you know, really um, had good discussions of, of a lot of the issues and I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Importantly, one of the early speakers was um, someone from the Office of the National Coordinator. This is a group that got many billions of dollars in ERA funding to kind of jumpstart and, and sort of um, get the, the uh, adoption of EHR going. And he reported that a number of sort of independent groups have come to relatively similar conclusions that by around 2019, they estimated there would be about 80% adoption of some form of electronic health record um, in the United States. Uh, that really both the health IT, the medical informatics, EHR community is, and genomics communities are, are making progress, um, but they are largely on independent tracks at the, at the moment. And that the relationship between these two needed to be formalized some so that they can articulate where they want to be and agree on how to get there. And he continually made reference to the transcontinental railroad that we needed to decide where we're going to meet and have the same gauge railroads and so that when we when we get there it does does hook up. To articulate a vision like this, to have a standards-based interoperable electronic health record uh, system that supports health care and research. Um, Another sort of very interesting concept that really sort of permeated, I think, everything was this, this notion of a learning healthcare system. I think there soon will be, or, or maybe already is, an Institute of Medicine report called the Digital Infrastructure for a Learning Health System. And this is the idea of a, of a kind of continuous feedback loop of, of using, cl using clinical data and clinical decision support systems um, to both improve healthcare and, and do clinically oriented research. There was a very nice talk from Zach Kohani um, on this notion of EDGER uh, or EHR driven genomics research. And I think something that caused both kind of excitement and concern was the blurring of the line between basic and health services research and clinical care. That really, you know, using the EHRs as a data source both brings all the tools we can bring very close to the patient. You know, these are real life um, situations but particularly from a, a human subject and consent issue, um, you know, we really no longer have, have this, this, this clear separation between what's a research study, what's a research question, what's a researcher doing with the data versus what is a clinician doing or, or a clinical informatics support system. Um, but this notion of, of having, you know, a kind of real-time decision-making um, and evaluating the outcomes of those decisions and integrating some discovery research was, was quite exciting. Um, there was a lot of talk of standards and maybe a little bit harkening back to the, the Arley House meeting. I mean, there were a couple of 
camps, um, a few people sort of said essentially we need a new standard like we need a new hole in the head or like we need a hole in the head and a new one maybe. <laughs> um, or that you know nobody can talk to anybody else because standards don't exist and until they are developed we can't make any progress. Um, I think sort of in general the idea was that we, we probably don't need completely new standards but the existing ones need to be um, sort of harmonized and be made, made more extensible. Um, Mark Yandel gave a very nice presentation on the genetic variation format, which is very similar to the VCF format. Um, but for example, the, the, uh, the leader of the HL7 genomics interest group who was there had never heard of GVH. Um, HL7 is the, 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 the system for actually sort of transmitting data back and forth, lab values and things like that between systems. Um, so it was more sort of the standards people getting together and understanding what each other's does and where they might need to be um, harmonized or, or extended was, was the focus. Certainly an acknowledgement that the phenotype and sort of genotype phenotype standards are much less well developed um, and that we need quality metrics for, for, for all of this data. Um, this may not be the very best, best title for a slide, but I put up here reinterpreting the genome. I mean, following up on that last point, there's you know, a lot of work that needs to go into developing how we would interpret a genome variation, genome variant or a whole set of genome variants today. But as difficult as that is um, to interpret the first time, we're going to need to continually reinterpret this for many years as our knowledge of the clinical implication of variants um, comes into being. And this was pointed out particularly by, I think, some of the vendors that the electronic health record is a medical legal document, that it needs to both document what the decision was made, but all the information that was available to that clinician at the time. And if they're making decisions based on a set of genomic variants, um, you know, how do we sort of harden what information we had then? Because next month there will be more data that might help you reinterpret or, or further interpret that, that genomic sequence. Um, the whole genomic sequence, or maybe not even the whole GPF, needs to be sort of part of completely within the EHR, but how we expose various parts of the GVH file or, or the genetic variants um, was, was discussed and, and needs to be worked on a lot. And also this notion of, of sort of critical values of a genetic variant file. Even if the clinician or the system doesn't support um, access to, that they haven't asked for results on a given sequence variant for a gene. Um, what if, based on whole genome, whole exome sequencing, you know that this person has a variant in a very high penetrance gene? Is that something that needs to be reported? But this is, these are, these are I mean, many of these are issues that, that have been um, uh, encountered in, in other areas. And I would sort of, there was some talk, you know, whether we're getting into the genetic exceptionalism again, because from an EHR vendor, they said on one level, a, a, a genomics test is no different than any other laboratory report. It gets ordered, you get a report, and the clinician interprets it. Um, but, and, and they face this in, in, in laboratory testing. When, when a clinician sends off a blood tube for a serum panel um, and they ask for electrolytes, these machines, they do all 500 tests, and they just don't, they only report the five that, that the person requested and, and paid for. But they do have this notion of critical values. If something that the clinician didn't order is so far out of range, um, that gets reported. There may be some, you know, are there genetic variants, such genetic variants, there's sort of, you know, a lot of, a lot of issues like that. Um, just, I think I just have two more slides. Um, Emerge um, was, was mentioned many times as kind of a trailblazer. There were a number of talks from Emerge investigators which, which went off very well. And it was really, I think, called out as an example of the kind of groundwork that's, that's necessary to, to figure out how to go forward and that, sort of continued um, expansion and, and extension of, of this model was, was, was really a good way to go. Um, Phoenix as well was, was called out as a way to begin to help the more on one level thorny problem of, of standardizing how we, how we just d define phenotypes. Um, we've talked a little bit about data security and data storage. Actually, a somewhat surprising, I think, conclusion at this was that, that since the medical record would be looking at maybe a GVF level or even a part of that file that the sort of data storage wasn't really seen as, as, as being a big issue because we're not, they wouldn't ever consider the kind of reads or, or lower level data. 
Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just sort of touch on these very, very, very briefly. Um, we, we haven't coalesced around a, a complete set of action items yet, but these were uh, some of them that, that we do, there is a, a, a need for some leadership in, in the standard space and getting these two communities to talk together. Um, there was a fair bit of talk and need a lot of work on sort of really sort of maybe moving beyond the standard informed consent model of an individual giving consent for a particular study that if we think of getting the best use of the electronic health record and the integrated genomics information that you need ways to mine this effectively to support clinical decision making um, without having certain records and certain parts fall in and out. We need to sort of get to um, ways of doing that. Um, there was certainly agreement that we need some mechanism to come up with some sort of set of standards and a way to sort of come up with what are the clinically relevant variants and, and how do we make that accessible to clinicians in, a, in an understandable way. Um, that we need pilot programs for demonstrating the clinical utility of genomics and EHR integration that sort of just showing that we can integrate them and isn't this neat and cool, we need to show that they actually provide clinical benefit and, and, are, and are cost effective as well. I think there was some more, but I, I think I'll stop there and let, let Greg and Rex and others make comments. Thank you. I, I can, I, it was a really nice summary of the meeting. It was, it was a really a great meeting. Uh, one of the things that struck me was the breadth of folks at the meeting, ranging from uh, electronic health records vendors all the way through genomics types. And um, just to emphasize a, a couple of points that Jeff made, I, in terms of standards, there's a strong sense that as the electronic health records uh, initiative rolls out more in the Office of the National Coordinator, uh, implements the rules for meaningful use, and as the uh, healthcare community implements meaningful use and deploys the HRs, it's going to really improve the quality of the data in electronic health records for future research. So it's a great, great opportunity and something we really need to pay attention to. And I think uh, looking at that in light of the kinds of things that Emerge has already been able to do, it's already pretty good, but if it gets really good or excellent going forward, it's really it's something we need to pay attention to. Um, one of the things that uh, I think strikes me as we think about these standards and how do you actually get a clinician to implement them, we need to think hard about how we annotate, and, and Jeff alluded to this, but just to put a finer point on it, how, how do we annotate the genome and the genetic variants that are actually clinically relevant and clinically actionable? And we need to really be paying attention to that because as we go forward, that's going to be a key piece of this. and sort of. In my own fantasy, you know, I imagine it would be really cool if there was a centralized data feed, a gen bank kind of like thing that had these annotated clinical variants and some quality score, if you will, that's attached to them um, that any hospital electronic health record could simply point their system at and get a web dump or a, a web services feed of this information and be constantly up to date. The problem, of course, is there are going to be local clinical standards that need to be applied and variation uh, across different sites to implement that. And a as I was talking about this um, at, at the meeting, I, I, I saw peop people like, you know, Peter Good just blanch as they thought about what the responsibilities and costs of doing something like that will be. So I think that's going to be a, a, a real challenge going forward. Um, and, and then uh, I thought, you know, actually I was very impressed by uh, Fengini, and I wondered if that might actually be a step in the direction of that kind of a, a data feed. Um, so we should pay attention to that. And then the final point that I'll make is um, I thought uh, there was also a fair amount of discussion of some of the LC issues about um, really what's different here is that there's so much data and it affects the families in ways that maybe some of the other things don't affect, uh, some of the other kinds of measures we're used to dealing with clinically don't affect. Um, families more broadly. So that was an important issue that needs to be thought about. Um, this idea of, you know, what level of data do you share? Uh, you, some people at the meeting were very clear that they never wanted to know their APOE alleles because they, you know, didn't want to have to deal with that consequence. And, and I think the other point that Jeff made that I would really emphasize is, you know, why is this any different from anything else that's in, in a clinical record in terms of uh, lab value? You know, we all know that your 
you know, total cholesterol level is probably a pretty good predictor of cardiovascular risk. And so, you know, maybe we're making too much to do about genomic information. So, uh, Lucia, or and then we'll let Greg say anything. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, Rex's comment about Fijini. So, working with NCBI, we've gotten to hear a little bit about what their uh, resources are like and what they're thinking about. And I think they are also interested in clinical annotation. Um, however, the data that they have right now are data that are essentially uh, submitted by um, outside users as clinically relevant. I don't think there's a common standard, and I think that's that's really what's missing. Although perhaps having some annotation at all is is, is better than nothing. Um, I think the the standards issue really needs to be addressed. Pearl. Yeah, um, I was only there for the first day of the meeting, but I think it was a good opportunity to have um, sort of those at the. Uh, federal level who are kind of putting together all the electronic health records and the mandates for those with the researchers, because they really seem to be a disconnect between we're creating this huge thing that will be good for clinical care and research without a lot of thought into do I want my stuff being used for research, as well as researchers putting research level information into the electronic medical records and kind of blurring different types of information. Um, the second thing I thought was very intriguing, there was a lot of talk about informed consent um, and, you know, everybody immediately, their eyes glaze over and think about the 40-page consent form, which we make with regularity. Um, and one, one guy got up, I forget what his name was, and really suggested perhaps we should look at this as public health reporting. You know, you get a gunshot wound, you're going to be reported to the police. Um, if you have high cholesterol, perhaps this should go into almost a public health reporting mechanism. So I think there was a lot of, there's some excitement about some different ideas, be it notification, more than informed consent, or you're know, looking at different uh, approaches. Yeah. Oh, uh, Greg, do you have Hi, any? Yes, it's Greg. I, I don't have much to add to those comments except to say that uh, there was some debate, I think, going into this meeting about the uh, timeliness of beginning to look at this intersection. And at least for me, and I think for some of the other attendees, um, there's a, a fairly good consensus that due to the huge inertia and amount of investment that's going into the public effort to have uh, EHRs be adopted nationwide, that it's better to be thinking about these topics and working on them now um, rather than trying to uh, 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 retroactively um, um, get uh, uh, a huge number of vendors and uh, academic systems to think about incorporating genomic information uh, 20 or 30 years from now. Howard's pointing up again. I, I was not sure you're talking about lunch upstairs or. No, no, I, have a, I, have a moment. I, I, uh, I am interested in that, as you can tell, but that's a different story. Um, I, I think that the, um, the this a lot of the comments that were made here about uh, trying to pull together some consensus around uh, which variants are, are actionable. Also, come back to the the presentation we had on the microbiome, uh, which is is uh, there's a lot of inertia out there, and I don't know if you're starting to see this, but we're, we're starting to get. Um, uh, clinical um, ads where um, Chinese companies will uh, will do your microbiome for you, and you, you know they should be calling it crap in a box because it that's basically what they're asking you to do. Um, you you crap in a box, send it overseas, and there you go. Um, but you can't send Chinese crap over to the U.S., so that's a different story. But uh, but but the the um, that that idea of annotating these things, I don't know if it's an Intrax issue or an SGR issue, but it's it's coming way faster than um, us so-called geniuses on the advisory council uh, realize. And I think it's uh, you guys need to act on it with or without our help. Yeah. It seems to me, you know, it's a, it's a tough issue. One of the, uh, one, in Eric's slide about the, uh, the CDC's population health genomics office going away in this, this EGAP program, I mean, that was incredibly labor intensive, went through a relatively small number of, of genetic variants. Yeah, don't do that. Right. I mean, we, so we need something in between that and a, a compute, completely computer-driven thing that, that simply spits them out. It has, there has to be has to, some level of human curation, but it, it can't be at the level of EGAP, and it needs to go. Many, many of us here are, are having to do it for our own institutions, and it would be nice if there was done at a national level or a regional level, not 
each hospital. Thank you. I think I've nearly gotten us back on time. Yeah, the speakers uh, <clears throat> this morning did very well keeping us on time. I think we have time to uh, uh, go upstairs, yes. break for lunch. Um, we can be back by one, let's say one twenty, so that we can really start at one thirty. Um, <clears throat> and if uh, all the presenters in the afternoon can uh, do as well as the presenters in the morning did in keeping on time, I think we'll be in good shape. Yes. yes. See you at 120. <laughs>